We're going to be studying some inside, but we're going to start off with some outside. We have a lot we're, we're trying to study and, and cover. There's a lot of discussions. A lot For me, it's been very thought-provoking, especially with pandemics going on and a lot of sadness out there in the world. And one of the main components, themes of this chapter is that bitterness, depression, sadness is just not an option because we are in a battle. We're in a battle on the front lines of our in, in our souls between the godly soul, the animal soul, and they're both vying for control, as we learned. And now we can have the impulse control, which is what we've been learning until this chapter, and how to not only have control on the outside, but we started working with some meditations to have it, that control going already from the inside, to already get attracted to the um, the godly side and to do to do what the godly soul wants without always having to push um, through some meditation and through some digging, realizing that we have a soul that is full of love, the level of our soul of chachma, which is that seed of godliness in, in us. And then we just have to uncover it and uh, get it to uh, uh, shine or get, wave it and it'll, it'll um, uh, fan it and, and it'll, the fire will grow strong. But now what we're, we're, what we're going on over here is that now that we mastered, we figured out how to get that soul to talk and to shine, there's things that come up in life that make it hard. And the Alter Rebbe in chapters 26, 27 is going through different parts of our life, both material we're going to start with, and then emotional and spiritual, things that um, uh, make us feel guilty or remorseful, or it just makes us feel bitter of what, what we're doing or who we are. And that, the Alter Rebbe is starting off the chapter by saying that's not an option because if someone is being sluggish, lazy, or, or sulking in their self-pity, or just sad, they can't win. Their godly soul is, is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to buckle. It's not going to work. So it's an it's a obligation of us. It's not only something that we want to have to be joyful. It's something that's needed. It's something that's obligatory. And uh, we quoted um, uh, from Tehillim, where it says that Yivdu at Hashem b'Simcha, chapter 100 of Tehillim, that says we have to serve God with joy. It's not just like any other mitzvah. Like we 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 have to light Shabbat candles and light the menorah, uh, Hanukkah, and eat kosher. Those are things that are integral to our Judaism. Uh, but this is a crucial element that has to be present throughout our day. Which means Friday night we light candles. We don't have an obligation to light candles on Monday morning. Or the eight days of Hanukkah, we have an obligation to light the menorah, but not the rest of the, of the year. But the, the importance of joy is there every moment of our day. It's an obligation that's, that totally takes over and is required every, every, every time we, we, step, we take a step in the morning. Everything we do needs to be infused with joy. And for those that have been to a Jewish wedding, there's, we do what's known as Sheva Brachot. We do the seven blessings under the chuppah. And then we actually do it for the rest of the next week after the, after the chuppah, after the wedding. And it actually lists out a bunch of different uh, variations of the Hebrew word of joy. Some of you may be familiar with these words. They, they make it into songs. It's sung under the chuppah. But the words are Gila, Rina, Ditsa, Chedva. All of those are different types of joy and love that is so crucial and important in our day as a Jew. And once we, are, we have a feeling of depression, sadness that is taking us over, it gives um, room for the animal soul to take control, to feel like it's able to be in charge. We feel lethargic. We feel apathetic. And it's easier for the animal soul to defeat and to, to, um, to, to control. There's nothing more imperative for the godly soul to have than the power of joy. That's the crucial element. Like we gave the example of the wrestlers, that even if he's more, if, even if he's more experienced and trained, if he's not feeling good that day, if he's feeling sluggish, he could be beaten easily. So the, to put it in other words, the, anim, the animal soul goes to great length to try to get us to be down because once we're down and sad it's much easier for the animal soul to 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 push its its agenda so that's why it's actually a battle that's constant for us to be joyful 
because I, mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not in the political world, but there's lobbyists that they invest millions of dollars to uh, in something because once they 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 they're, the lobbyists do what they do, it's much easier to pass their agendas. So they invest a bunch of effort and 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 resources, etc. So the animal soul is investing so much of its effort to get us to be sad. And it's just not an option for us. We need to fight that because that's the most integral thing for a Jew in a service is to be happy, to be joyful. So what we're exploring now in these chapters is things that interfere with joy, things that get in the way, challenges that arise, both, like I said, material or emotional and spiritual, that cause us to, to be sluggish, that we have to remain strong and joyful and, go, and move past it. That will allow us to truly be joyful. Um, any questions so far? So there's some... And uh, I hope this, um, I know I, I've, I've been giving some summaries, but it's uh, for me, like learning these chapters, it's always important to go back and just um, uh, summarize it. At least it's, it's clarifying for me. I hope it's doing the same for you. So number one, to rid ourselves, and I, I think maybe I glossed over this part of this chapter, so I just wanted to emphasize a point over here. The first step towards joy, to rid, to rid ourselves from sorrow and worries First of all, we have to want to be happy, meaning we have to make a conscious effort to say this is important. <clears throat> so obviously, who doesn't want to be happy? But it's really a choice that we have to make. And some people have a tendency, it's actually easier to be more negative and to be more sad um, uh, people maybe give you more attention or whatever it is. It's almost something that it works. So first of all, we have to make a conscious decision and a choice that this is something I want and this is something is needed in my service for my day to day. We have to realize that we, need, we, we, we are needed to be happy and we are obligated. And we see the facts, people that are happy are, are more productive. And like I've, I've mentioned before, um, whether it's Facebook or Google or any other small business, they invest a bunch of money to make their employees happy, to make to do things in the environment, in the work and office environment, to um, to to make their employees happy. Because the, the the facts are that employees that are happy are able to be more pr producing results. They're more motivated. Um, And the, the fact is, when we're happier, it's much easier for our godly soul to um, defeat and, um, and overcome the animal soul. So that's number one, that we have to make a conscious effort that we need to be happy. And we have to want it. And then realize, and I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I'm, I wrote a bunch of notes and I'm just going back and forth a little bit. Um, so just one last thing over here on this topic. Yeah. And I guess, let me just take some questions. Uh, you mentioned that time should be set aside for feeling bad introspection. Can you elaborate on this, please? How much time should be set aside, for instance, all day? A, a, a great question. So yeah, in the first section of this chapter, we, we talked about um, uh, realizing the that the, there's a gain, or as Solomon says, King Solomon says, the profit that comes as a result of sadness. Usually it's something we don't want. But when it does creep up, we have to make sure to benefit from it and not to allow it to just be there, but to um, allow it to um, uh, lift us up and be used as a gain, as a fuel for our enthusiasm. How do we do that? By setting aside a time um, the way the Tanya says it over here is by Tikkun Chatzot, which is the midnight prayer that really it's very rare. And I don't think there's many people that do it today. Uh, but it's dedicating a time. I would say it's um, a, a, either an hour a week. Or if you if you prefer, if you think it's more beneficial to do it daily, it would be um, five minutes a day. 
um, and it's it's utilizing that time, things that you feel um, that need to be corrected, utilizing that time to be um, to um, in in a in a service of God. Just close this much better. And once we realize that we have the need to be happy, we want to be happy, then we have to realize that everything comes from Hashem. And in a moment, Hashem in His infinite power can change things around. And the more we strengthen our awareness that our livelihood is in the hands of Hashem and it's flowing directly from Him. Uh, in the example of livelihood, Hashem could change around our, our fortune. And the same is true with any tribulation a person is going through in life. If you have the trust in God, you realize that Hashem in His infinity and His infinite power can change it. Now, the sensitive topic that we were talking about is that everything that happens is happening from God's supervision. The, the quote we gave from the Talmud that um, whether it's good that's happening in a person's life or God forbid not good, we still bless God. It's a different blessing. But there still is a blessing, a prayer that we say. Even though it may appear that it's not good, still it's for our best. And when bad things happen, we have to realize that it will lead to a good outcome. Now, the challenge is obviously, and this is the, the sensitive part, is that we don't realize, we don't see the good outcome. Whether it's like a, ch a child who doesn't realize that when the parents are taking something away from him, it's because it's for, for, their, for the child's benefit. It's dangerous. So it's out of love that it's being removed. The child cries. He doesn't see the bigger picture. When things that are, that are happening to us that are painful, we don't see the bigger picture of how it's really for our good. In this week's parasha, the reason why I wanted to make sure to get this part in, because in this week's parasha, we have the story of Yosef. It's one of the most phenomenal stories in the entire Torah. I have to say it's probably my favorite. The story of Yosef being sold, thrown under the bus by his own brothers, 10 of his brothers, brought down to Egypt. And it turns out to the best. We'll see in next week's Torah portion how, in fact, he was able to keep his whole family alive because he became the viceroy of Egypt. And long story short, he provided, um, uh, he navigated Egypt through the times of famine. And when the, the brothers in Israel were diving, uh, dying of hunger, they went to Egypt and they got food from him. Eventually he told them that he, who he is. And the, Jacob came down and they all lived happily ever after, right, until they all died. And then this, this uh, enslavement, enslavement in Egypt began. But what happened is, after Jacob dies, in next week's, and we'll see in, in uh, two weeks, they, the brothers were worried that until now Jacob was alive, so Yosef was nice to us. Because out of respect for my father, I'm going to be nice to the rest of my brothers. But once Jacob died, the brothers started feeling, uh-oh, maybe now Joseph will take some revenge. So they plead in front of him and they say, they send, they send their children and they say, please, Joseph, don't uh, pay us back in, 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 with, bad, with, bad, um, with punishment. And, and Joseph cries when he hears this. And he says, do you think it's you that did it? You think you sold me? All this happened from God. God knew that this needed to happen. And I thank God for this happening. It's an incredible part of the story where Joseph was privy to see the full picture, how because he was sold. And when I say sold, it, like I can't explain. We, we, we don't understand what it meant for a 17-year-old to be lost, disappeared. He spent 12 years, Joseph, the righteous Joseph, spent 12 years alone in a dungeon. Now we're, we're spending time alone and it's, it's, we're driving us crazy. Joseph did that for 12 years without anyone caring for him. No one checking up on him. And yet, with all that harshness that he was treated with, he was able to say this was all from God. Wow. <clears throat> so what's the hardest part and what's deeper that we need to really, what we, what's been sensitive and what we're trying to tap into over here, the greatest good... <clears throat> that happens to us is specifically the things that appear to us as bad. 
that's the bottom line of where we're up to in Tanya now in chapter 26 is actually the greatest good seems like it's bad. It's just coming from such a high level of good that we can't, we can't appreciate it. There's a lower level of good that we could see and say, ah, this tastes so good. But there's a higher level of good that is beyond our comprehension of how this is good. <clears throat> when a sick child, hold on one second. Would that be like looking for the silver lining and everything and finding the blessing and the lesson? So it's not, so we're, yes, Maddie, it is finding the blessing, but it's even, we're taking it a step further. And this is, this is the tough part is saying how it's not also a blessing. It's not even a silver lining. This is the gold. We, we were getting, we have to be joyful in what happens because it's the best possible thing that could happen to us. That That's the radical statement here is that we're so lucky that we're experiencing this pain. that God loves us so much and he's giving it to us. It's such, it, it's so, it, it's, it's easy to say. And no one could ever utter these words. We could talk about it. But unless a person experiences it, no words can, can do justice to understand this topic. The Alter Rebbe is someone who himself, the author of this Tanya, himself experienced pain his entire life. Pain of losing his child. His daughter died when he was when she was in her twenties, and it caused him extreme anguish. Um, the way he was actually, he was in his fifties, if I'm not mistaken. May have been forties or late, late, the Alter Rebbe, the author of this Tanya. He was in his either late forties or early fifties, and he was dying. And his daughter, her name was Rebetzin Devorah Leah. Some of you may know the story. But she realized that her, her father and his service to the Jewish world is, an, is a crucial. And, he, and she needed him to continue developing Chabad. So she herself made an oath that she's giving her life for her father. And she died that year. The only condition she made was that she... she um, she uh, wanted her father to take care of her two-year-old child. She had a two-year-old child, her only child, and she died when he was two. And, and her father, the Alter Rebbe, took care of this young child. He later became the third Chabad Rebbe. He was raised on his grandfather's lap. He was known as the Tzemach Tzedek. His name was Menachem Mendel. He died in the 1860s. Um, our Rebbe is named after him. He was the third Rebbe. Our Rebbe is the seventh Rebbe. There were four generations apart, son after son. Um, and that was, his name was Rebbe, the Rebbe Menachem Mendel. His wife's name was actually Chaim Mushka, which is similar. Our Rebbe and Rebetzin had those same names, um, both direct uh, in the direct lineage. Um, he, uh, the Alter Rebbe, just saying a little bit more, his, you could actually read, if you have this uh, uh, this translation of the Tanya, the practical Tanya, in the introduction, it goes through the Alter Rebbe's life. And you see such tragedy, first from the en enormous opposition of the Mitznagdim, the opposition who uh, fought against the ways of Hasidus and against Tanya, to the point where when this book, Tanya, was published, they informed him to the Russian government as a traitor on false charges. And he, he had to, he was, the Alter Rebbe had to sit in jail for two months under in extremely dangerous conditions. But it got worse. Not only the misnagged in the opposition disproved, um, uh, didn't like the growth and development of Hasidus, even colleagues of the Alter Rebbe, other Hasidic groups, went against him. And that caused him enormous pain. When there was rift in between different Hasidic sects, they, they disapproved of his um, teachings of Tanya and teachings of Hasidus. He had an, a, 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 other difficult parts. And what he's saying here is taking it all with, with, with joy. So no one who 
God forbid, we all have our pekalach. We say in Yiddish, we all have our, our struggles, challenges, and suffering, each to their own. No two people suffer the same way. Pain is something that's very personal. It's almost something that's very lonely. No one could um, uh, resonate with another person's pain. No one could understand it. So for, for uh, the, I think this, the way the, the story, there was someone who was talking about this topic in uh, university, I think in Israel, he was talking about uh, the, 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 the importance of pain in our life and taking it with joy. And someone in the crowd who was new to Teshuva, learning more Torah, she was um, on the cancer floor of the hospital in Israel. And she saw patients every day that struggled and were suffering for them and their family members with enormous pain and, and, and illness. And she was at this lecture. And she said, would you do me a favor? Try to give this lecture down the street at the hospital to that, on that ward, on that, on that floor. Meaning someone who doesn't experience it, you, 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 you could teach it. But unless you feel it, it's not something you preach to someone else. So utilizing this chapter of Tanya, it's not something when someone goes through pain, you say, oh, you should take it with joy. It's something very personal. It's something for us to study for ourselves. It's not something to be preaching to someone else because it is a very sensitive topic. No one could understand the pain that anyone else goes through. To, so to say, take it with joy, it's, 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 it, it, it could give a person a headache to hear. It's not what they need to hear. But the truth remains that what we're trying to get to, and I'll try to summarize my points because I, I really want to get to the text, and I'm sure you do as well. Well, we're, we're the main segment over here in this, in this section of Tanya is learning that there's a world that is manifested of God, what we see and appreciate. It's called Alma de Escalia. And I'm going to be using a little more of the Hebrew terms, so bear with me. Alma de Escalia is the revealed manifested world that we appreciate and can touch and see. And then you have Alma de Escasia. Escasia comes from the Hebrew word kisoi, which means covered. And it's talking about the covered world. And what we can feel and experience here is a revealed world, but there's a much higher world. To give you, by way of an example, a teacher who, who loves his students, what he does in order for them to comprehend the teachings, what does he have to do? He has to enclose this teaching in a, in a parable. You give examples, you give metaphors, and then the student can, can grasp it. By getting, the, in Hebrew it's called the mashal, by getting the parable, the analogy, the example, you could then give the nimshal, which is, how do you say a nimshal in English? What's the opposite of an analogy? Uh, an anal um, what's the word for the, there's the analogy and then there's the, anyone know? There has to be a word of the opposite of the analogy. I forgot what it is, but the analog? No. Okay, whatever it is. Um, but what, what happens if one day the teacher says, you know what, I love my students so much, I'm going to give them the direct teaching. I'm going to give them the deep teaching that, for the most part, no one else can understand. You know what happens? The student doesn't get it. And it makes him more confused than ever. She doesn't understand it. So by the teacher giving the analogy, He's actually not holding back a teaching. He or she is actually allowing the student to grasp it. And the same is with the sun and there's a shield. Like the, the verse we, we quoted, I think, from um, uh, Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, that there's a covering, a layer, a, a shield, protective shield over around the sun so that we can appreciate the sun. So that analogy is like the protective shield, so that it's not too direct, that we can't grasp it, we'll burn if we got the sun too close. This way we're able to uh, grasp it. If the shield was removed, we wouldn't be able to appreciate it because it's coming from too high of a level. The teachings of the teacher is coming from too deep in his mind that the students can't appreciate it. So it seems like an overwhelming experience. Pain is that same thing. Pain and suffering that a person, God forbid, experiences is coming from a level that 
can be appreciated. It's just interesting. I was reading the story of an even higher level. One, the level we're learning here is appreciate the suffering uh, with joy because realize that it's coming from a much higher level. Then there's an even higher place that a person doesn't even see it as suffering. That's not, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Over here, we see suffering and we're told really it's coming from a higher place. There's a story of Reb Zusha of Anipoli. Reb Zusha, in the introduction to this Tanya, he was a colleague of the Alter Rebbe who actually gave his approbation, gave his approval of the Tanya. Reb Zusha of Anipoli, he was a Hasidic master, giant. And he was a disciple, like the Alter Rebbe, was a disciple of the, the Magid, the preacher of Mizrich, who was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, and they were colleagues. And once another follower of the Magid, of the teacher, went to him and said, I'm trying to learn how to serve God with joy. How do I make sure I have joy in my service? Am I having struggles? So the teacher, the Magi, told him, I want you to go to Zusha of Anipali, spend some days with him, and you'll, you'll see how to, how, to, how to be joyful in your service. So he pulled up to Zusha of Anipali's house. Anipali, if I'm not mistaken, is in the Ukraine. And he comes to the door. The place was a shack. Zusha was living in utter poverty. The door was not even working. He gets into the house. The furniture were broken. There was barely any food in the house. The beds were all caved in. The, the ceiling, the roof was leaking. And Zusha had actually very bad health. He, he, was, he, was, he wasn't a physically good health. And he spent a few days there. And Zusha welcomed him in, of course. And after a few days, he asked the chassid, my friend, what brings you here? Like, why, why, were you, why did you come? And he says, oh, my, our teacher, the Magid, told me to spend some days with you to learn from. He said, what, do you, what, did, he, what did you want to learn from me? He said, I was struggling with learning how to serve God with joy, even in the state of challenges, how to have, how to have joy. And Reb Zusha was astonished. Like, why would he send you to me? I don't have any challenges. Like, why would, why would he direct you to come to me for someone that doesn't have any struggles, any challenges? So that's an even higher level, I think, when you don't even see the suffering as suffering. The level we're talking about in Tanya is, it is suffering. Absolutely. But take it with joy. A higher level that I don't know if we're meant to reach is a level of a tzaddik, which is they don't even see the suffering. But the way Tanya, which is meant for me and you, it's a book that's meant for us, the book of the in-betweener, the Bainani, which is me and you, what we're learning about here is you have the suffering, and we all have our, our set of challenges, and health challenges, and family challenges, and livelihood challenges, crisis, and yet, take it with joy, because know that it's coming from the higher level, a higher world of Alma de Iskasia, the hidden world. I have a friend, their last name is Shusterman. There are Chabad rabbis everywhere. They're a family of 11, and the, the boys and the girls, the siblings, are, are Chabad rabbis from Los Gatos in, in, in the Silicon Valley to um, Maryland and, and, and Massachusetts and, and LA. They're, they're in Canada and, and in countries across the world. They're all over the place. They're a wonderful family. They're, um, and and in, in 1985, uh, their mother passed away. The youngest was three months. The oldest was 14. They were 11 children. And um, the father raised them. He, he remarried. And then he, he raised an incredible family, the Schustermans. So at one of uh, the weddings, maybe around 10 years ago, the father... He got he, at one of the, the weddings, the Sheva Brachot, which is the week long festivity after the wedding. He spoke about, about this topic from this Tanya. And he said, There's two attitudes when a person experiences suffering, there's two attitudes a person could have. One is you look at God and you say, You busted me, I'm going to bust you. You try, treated me with this suffering, I'm going to treat you the same way and, and, and close the door. I'm going to close the door on you. You say goodbye to faith. 
And goodbye to trust. You stop trusting people. And really, no one can blame you. But then there's an attitude. Take, for example, a friendship, he says. Because really, God is like an ally. God is supposed to be a friend that you could turn to. And that's uh, like a friendship. And in a friendship, everything is good. You get along. And some days there are some rock, rocky moments taken in your relationship with God. Some days you have you come down with a bad cold. And some days you get locked out of your car. Some days there's inconveniences, but you say, no, we're in this. We'll, we'll stick it out. It's not so bad. But then when there's something that happens that's really a bust, something that happens that is so big in a friendship or in your relationship with God, what you have to do at that point is either you can have the first attitude and say, I'm closing the door. Or a second attitude is you dig deeper. You have to discover the deeper part of this friendship. And what you did during this time is you're actually loyal to yourself. So this is the level where you could reach. He was talking about him raising his children himself, that after he lost his wife, he was strong. And no one could ever, he could speak it because he experienced it. But you can't share this to someone else that's going through it. And think of it like what we were saying before, because all I could share is words. And words is from a level that is revealed. Words is there to relate, to express. Like we were saying before, it's how God created the world, which is the revealed world. So anything with words is a meant, uh, which is to communicate, is, is in the revealed world. That's what words, by definition, are. It's to communicate something. It's to reveal and express something. So words can't tap into, words can't speak of what's going on in the hidden place that is beyond expression, in this hidden world of Alma Discasia. Because in that place, it's hidden. It's sacred. The level of Alma Discasia is like the level in the Holy of Holies, which was stood in the temple that only one person, once a year, was able to enter. Anyone else going in couldn't handle the holiness of that place. The loneliness of that place. So when you approach a place of sadness, sorry, a place of, of, of this hiddenness, the sacred space of Alma Discasia, it's a place like Holy of Holies. It's not, it's not a place where you speak in. There's actually places in the Talmud, and Barbara, I'm wondering if, if Howard studied these parts, I'm sure he did, where there's a discussion. Usually Talmud, they all have witty responses. They're all answering back. But then there's some, it says they remain silent. They were quiet. They weren't quiet because they didn't have an answer. They were quiet because they were speaking from a higher place that was beyond speech. Their response didn't even come with an answer. That was their response. It says when Aaron, the high, the Kohen Gadol, the high official, the high priest in the temple, he lost two of his children. On the, the, the it was actually Rosh Chodesh, like today, it was Rosh Chodesh Nisan. On the great festivities, he lost his two older children, Nadav and Avihu. And his response to the suffering, Vayidom Aharon. Aaron was silent. He wasn't silent because he didn't know what to say. He was silent because he realized this is coming from a place that's hidden. Like a Kodesh HaKadashim, like the Holy of Holies. That was a silent place. It was a sacred space. So it's such a hard topic to say that a place of God forbid suffering is actually coming from a place that is beyond what's manifest. And it's a place that's almost like sacred. It's God gifting you from a place that's beyond expression. And he's allowing you... He's, he's, He's he allowing you entry into that space. And like in a friendship, if someone is going through a challenge, a friendship is not just someone who you could go on vacation with and play golf with. A friendship is someone who, when they're going through their suffering, you know how to be there for them without necessarily even speaking. What are you? You're quiet with them. Because you realize that it's coming from a higher place that nothing, no words I can share will help, but you'll just be there. So that's appreciating. So people that are able to find that love of God, even in the place of suffering, and can remain joyful even in that 
status. It says when Mashiach comes, they will experience the sun shining directly on them. Not just the physical sun. It means the level of spiritual man, um, uh, expression of God into the world, of God's divine flow of energy into the world, will be on such a high place when Mashiach comes to them because of their attitude, that, the way it is now, that they'll get directly from the source, directly from the sun, without any need of any protective shield to taper it down. That's the Alma de Scassia, the hidden world versus the concealed the, and the concealed world, the duality and realizing that a place of suffering is coming from a higher a dimension of godliness. In, in Kabbalistic terms, it's the first two letters of God's name, the Yud and the He, that is higher than um, uh, the, the last two letters. Okay, that's a little bit of my thing. We're now we'll go into the text, but definitely I'll take questions. And if anyone prefers to ask their question rather than speak it, of course, just unmute yourself, because I know we're talking about some pretty lofty ideas. Um, uh, Joseph forgives his brothers. We forgive people who have knowingly and inwardly wronged in prayers. But exactly before bedtime, we actually do that prayer. Awesome. Very good. It is radical, especially if you have lost someone or battling it as a different mindset. Exactly. And no one... If someone else is going through it, it's not our place to tell them what their mindset should be. That's called chutzpah. But a person um, who is experiencing it and, and studies this and meditates on this idea, it could be incredibly helpful. But absolutely, no one who, God forbid, went through the Holocaust, no one should tell them what they should be feeling. It's not their place. Anyone who went through the Holocaust has the badge to decide exactly how they want to cope with it. And no one can tell them, uh, statistically, you should be this way or you should be that way, because statistics and any, any, anything else goes out the window. But someone who's going through it with this mechanism, with this um, uh, advice from Tanya, that we still have a lot to study in it, um, it's, it, it's an, inc an incredible and powerful coping. Um, that's a good question. Robin is asking, wasn't the opposition to Hasidism every other Jew? Hasidism was essentially a reformation movement of Judaism, right? Um, no, not, not the way I understand it. Um, the Misnagdim were the elitists that were studying uh, a lot in, in the uh, academies in, in Russia, this is. And they took... Um, um, it's a, it's a good topic. Uh, and Robin, we studied this before our class. So it's actually started a year ago, November 19. Um, look, if you do me a favor, in the, um, the introduction of Tanya, you'll see the whole biography of the Alter Rebbe. It goes through it. I don't think I would love to hear if you could read it. It's been a while. It's been a year since I've read it. I don't think it was a reformation. Reformation, me, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'll read up on it because it's okay. very interesting. I, I sort of always feel like I'm getting, I'm not getting the whole picture when a Chabad rabbi tells me the story. <laughs> so, well, I mean, the writing in the biography is also from a Chabad rabbi. His name is Rabbi Miller, who wrote the. I the, love Ra Rabbi Miller. I adore. I, his scholarship is impeccable. So read his, I, I agree with you. So read his, and you were quoting his book last week also from the Rebbe. So read his biography and, um, and tell me if, after you read it. Uh, but it's, it's a really well done in, in, in this book of the Tanya. So in the introduction, you can read it. Tell me what you think. Um, Rabbi, I have a question. Is this something that you can decide? That you can actually decide that you're going to have this view? Or is it something that's, again, given to you through study that you naturally come to that place? To, to, to study? To, well, well, I missed one word over there. Ask the question again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like this whole concept of finding the joy or understanding that there it's been given to you from the hidden world. If you're studying this, like we are studying it with you right now, can you make the decision? I'm going to look for that or see that or appreciate that in my life. Uh, doing it for yourself, not necessarily putting it on other people when they're suffering. Can you decide that or is it something that has to come through you uh, in, almost like in a surrendered way that you can't force? So I, I think, and I would love to hear other people on this. I'll give you my, my, my two cents. I think that it is something you have to decide on. And, right. um, and uh, the reason why I think that is because that's why the Altar Rebbe is putting it in Tanya, to teach you that this is within your reach to be able right. to accomplish, to be able to make that decision that this is how I'm going to take it. And, okay. 
and every person's pain is different. So just because a person's pain that he's feeling may be stronger for him, but my pain, whatever it is, it's strong for me. And therefore, um, this chapter is an imperative for everyone to study. And 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 also, I'll, I'll say one more thing, Maddie, is that it's not just like a one-time decision. It's like a constant learning. And, and it's yeah. not even just this t- chapter. When you when you when you're in touch with Torah, it just becomes the routine of how you look at things right. with, with a trust and a, and and a, with, and a submission, but at the same time with a a conscious effort to understand and to to to, to make it right. Um, do me a favor. I don't know if you're going to be listening to Adina prepared a beautiful Torah and tea today for one o'clock. Um, a lot of it is going to be on this topic, not not necessarily about suffering, but about realizing that you have to be anchored in Torah on a constant basis, and that has to be your 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 worldview has to be through the Torah, and to have that, you have to constantly be involved in it. Right. That's okay. Good. That answers my question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. There's a lot more to talk about, and I love these questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling down. There's your unlikeness distinction, digging deeper and not giving up is so important. Yeah, agreed. I'll just read another question here that came in, I think, uh, directly. Is it true that people used to put a rope around the Kohen Gadol's ankle in case he died in the Holy of Holies and they had to pull him out in case he died? Right, exactly. And unfortunately, so there were, in, during the times of the Second Temple, there was actually a period that was kind of corrupt, which means when the Greeks were in charge, there was still a Kohen. Right, there was Yochanan Kohen Gadol. He was the good guy, but for many years before then, uh, before the Maccabees, a lot of it was was bought out, so that the Greeks put a Jew in charge of the temple. But it was a Jew who bought his way in. They weren't worthy for it. They had no connection to it, but they had the money for it. So they became in charge. It was a disgusting time. It was it was hard to imagine. So there was a period, I think, of 80 years when every year the Kohen Gadol would go in, but he wasn't worthy for the job of going into the Holy of Holies on the Yom Kippur, and he wouldn't make it out. So the law was that no one else could go in to pull him out. So they would actually always have, have put him in with a rope in case he wasn't uh, privy to come out. They were able to take him out by yanking him. So, But there was a period where that happened uh, on an annual basis. They had to pull him out. Yeah. Um, is it, so you, I think you can meditate um, on it and decide. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I have I have one more question. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Yeah. Um, so if you're in your everyday life and there's someone around you, or if you have a friend or a family member that is really suffering on something that they find like they can't understand maybe they've had a disagreement with someone or they feel like they've not been paid enough money for something just things that are just like everyday earthly things and you're sitting there kind of listening and you feel like oh I I, I can so see this a lesson for you but you you know saying that to them they don't want to hear it is it is it recommended then that you just stay quiet you don't say anything or is it that you can point out what's possible? Like, like, this is. Oh, I love it. I, I'm, I'm just not the experts and the experience here. Um, we'll start. If anyone could pop in, but I'll start with Barbara. Do you have anything to answer for Maddie? That's a great question, Maddie. What do you do when you know someone could use it? How, how do you? Uh... Yeah, I I offered the viewpoint of what Rabbi was talking about just now to some friends who have a daughter in the East Bay who's dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. I said, but look at all the wonderful Zooms that you have with their children. And you know, you you wouldn't feel as close to to her as you do, except for the fact that she has got cancer. Mm -hmm. So the woman got so mad at me. (laughs) Right. And so that was, I learned the hard way that this is nothing to talk about. When, mm-hmm. when, when you see someone in, in that place. Mm-hmm. I love that. And, and also, and I'm asking about things that are also maybe causing someone a lot of stress that is not death, 
but like earthly concerns like oh I didn't get a bonus at the Christmas time or Hanukkah time or oh I, I've worked so hard and I'm not being appreciated or oh my mother-in-law can't stand me and I don't know what I've done things like that where you just you know when we're studying this stuff when we are all studying this stuff or whoever is studying this stuff it's like well actually you know there's it's there's such beautiful gifts in there for us to learn and grow and really understand and 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 develop gratitude and get stronger when you can see it so clearly but would you still say nothing and just say uh okay or yes i understand or oh that must be really hard for you when you're just like oh my gosh you just that's so not a big I mean uh, I don't know I'm just wondering what if and I think and I'm, I'm happy with what Barbara answered because it's a reminder that every situation is different and every person can handle it differently yes. and you have to know your space and you have to know the person and you have to know the situation uh, yes. that it is in so I, I wish there was a one one uh, she was saying silence she uh, was saying silence is golden yeah uh, silence is golden um thank I you love the, the the i don't know it's uh, i don't have an answer because i don't think there's a one there it's not a cookie cutter um moment over here the author is for sure talking about you i think it's talking about how do you cope with it not how to help someone else cope with it but if you're a good friend and you love that person you want to share this right so how to do that sensitive with the sensitivity it's, it's an art, and I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's great. Oh, uh, wow. It's, um, and, and yeah, because for you, it may seem petty, and for them, it may seem like the most important thing in the world. So every person can handle things differently. I love this. Guy, I'm, I'm learning so much with all of you. So um, I'm really appreciating our study. I'm learning just how to open my eyes more. So I, I really appreciate all of this. Um, just my, my weekly warning. Uh, the Kindle is about to come up on the screen, so you're going to hear a, um, uh, a a man talking behind me, and I think it's just the automatic system. When you experience pleasure, it can be harder to... Here we go. Okay. And um, just on this topic, we had a, um, we had a menorah lighting on, on Sunday. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of people there. Um, uh, Shira was there and, and with Thomas that um, he helped us guide all the traffic, which was really nice of him. Um, I, I wanted to show on, we, we hired a, uh, the Eighth Day, which is a very popular band in the Jewish world that we're going to, they recorded. I, I paid some good money for them to record a, um, a concert, a virtual concert. And, but I wasn't able to show it, then it was fine. It's, uh, the, the people were inspired. Uh, people went home to light menorahs, which is the most important. I've learned that the technology, the, um, the microphones are not the important part of all this. But uh, one of the videos I wanted to show was from a friend of ours. His name is Yitzi Harwitz, Rabbi Yitzi Harwitz. He's uh, suffering of ALS. He was a rabbi in Chabad of Temecula in, next to San Diego. And for, this, from his, for almost five or six, six years, probably, he's been suffering from ALS very, very severe. He can't move any part of his body besides for his eyes. And he communicates now through a, a screen that um, it sounds exactly like this audio that was just playing in the background. If you, I'm assuming you were able to hear it. Um, uh, so it's just an audio he types using his eyes. And, and it's incredible how it works. So I, I, I couldn't visit him for a year because obviously I can't visit him during Corona, but usually during um, when I, on my visits to Southern California, I would spend time with him. And he, he, I went with my boys and he asks them to, to read, uh, to say the 12 verses. There's 12 passages of the Torah that the Rebbe taught children to know by heart. So he wants them to say the, he's incredible. He studies every day. He gives, he writes blogs, parasha thoughts. I would be happy to share it with you, but um, he wrote a song. He he was a he was the most jolly Chabad rabbi. Uh, he still is. But um, when I was a, when I was a seventeen year old yeshiva boy in L.A., my first Chabad going to Chabad house experience. I grew up in Montreal in a very established community, and when I went to yeshiva in L.A. For a few Shabbats, they allowed us to go to Chabad rabbis and to help them in their in their Chabad house. Really, it was more than us helping them. The Chabad rabbi helped us. The first Chabad rabbi I met in California that really gave me the impression of what a Chabad rabbi is like 
on, on the on the, in the in on the field in the deserts in like in, in Temecula, was this Chabad Rabbi Yitzhi Horowitz. Um, I went in 2003 or 2002, and uh, he was so jolly. He had a guitar and he was singing and he was always upbeat. And he he um, he he made a song. Uh, it's called "Shine a Little Light." And Shira, I don't know if uh, we had his wife. His, her, his wife's name is Dina Horowitz. She actually spoke at our Chabad house last year, October, um, about finding strength through struggle. It was a very powerful talk. We unfortunately it was before COVID, so we haven't we weren't recording anything. Um, but it's it's she, she, we were thinking about just getting her again to speak over Zoom. Uh, she was very powerful. But one of the things we shared was a song written by her husband that they uncovered, meaning he wrote this when he was a, a yeshiva boy himself. It's called Shine a Little Light. So he couldn't sing it anymore. So they had all the big singers in the Jewish world get together and sing it together. Shine a Little Light. We were planning on showing it at our menorah lighting on Sunday. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, but I, 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 right after we're done, I'll actually share the, um, the, the YouTube link with you. It's, it, I found it very powerful. And it's about this idea of shining a little light. He wrote it way before he ever got ill, but it's, uh, it definitely resonates, especially with Hanukkah, the power of light. Um, in a place of darkness, you find the light, which is in a place of suffering, you have um, a gift from God. And um, it's, it's a very powerful um, talk. Anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. Without further ado, sorry for the delay, I'll share my screen and we will continue our study. Uh, someone could correct me. I have us on 303. Does that sound right to everyone, Robin? Yeah, we're on 303. My marker has starting with this answers our earlier questions. Good. All right. It's always a good thing to have the answer to the earlier questions. So let's see. <laughs> um, I think this just went a little back. There we go. So we're on the bottom of uh, the page on the Kindle. I'll make it a little bigger. And we're um, exactly in the middle of 303. So uh, we'll just dig right in because I already told you a little bit of this background of the sun coming out of its shield when Mashiach comes. But who does that happen to? It happens to those who accept uh, suffering with joy. So this answers our earlier question. Why the Talmud cites a verse about the sun going out in its strength in reference to those who happily accept suffering? So the Talmud says that who are those who um, the sun goes out in its strength? The Talmud says it's referring to those who accept um, suffering happily. Why is that? So the Tanya asked, what's the connection? What does the sun going out in its strength have to do with accepting suffering? So now he's answering it. The sun going out in its strength is a metaphor for the spiritual disclosure of the unmanifest world in the future. That when Mashiach comes in the future, the unmanifest world will be fully uncovered, will be fully displayed, um, dis disclosed. By aligning your consciousness now to the unmanifest world through transcending your personal experience of suffering, you make yourself ready for the future time when God will unveil the presently unmanifest world for all mankind. Awesome. So when Mashiach comes, the unmanifest world will be fully shining. How do you prepare yourself to be able to appreciate that unmanifest world? By now, when the unmanifest world is shining now, which is coming through a place of suffering, if you're able to accept it happily, then when Mashiach comes and the unmanifest world is fully shining to mankind, you will be ready to accept it because you already accepted it happily. So it's amazing because that's just a simple Talmud that says that the sun shining strong is referring to accepting suffering with, uh, with joy. How do what well, the Alter is saying? What's the connection between the sun shining? So he's saying the sun shining is referring to this hidden world that is like the source, the sun that we usually we need a protective shade to protect us from it. But when Shia comes, the sun, this unmanifest world will be shining strong. So now when we accept it. With uh, happy uh, with happiness, will be privy to be able to handle it when Mashiach comes. The the presently, uh, I think I have to turn the page. The presently unmanifest unmanifest will then shine and illuminate profusely and intensely to all those who took refuge in God in the current era, 
who have previously aligned themselves with the consciousness of the unmanifest by happily accepting suffering. And this experience will be possible only for those who retreat in a shade. So that's a quote. If you remember before, before we quoted from chapter 91, it says, Yoshev Beseter Elyon, which means those who sit in the shade of the Most High. So it's referring to the shade, meaning the shade now. So the, let's just read this again. This experience will be possible only for those who retreat in his shade. Now, in the current era, i.e., they find God and even the darker experiences of pain and suffering. So those who retreat in a shade, the shade is referring to the parts of, of life that are like a shade, that God is shining in a way of a shade, that it seems like dark, it seems like suffering. So those who retreat in the shade, then when Mashiach comes, we have that experience of the unmanifest world that we're able to tap into. What is the shade? It's referring to the shadow of Chachma. That's a quote from King Solomon, Sail HaChachma, the shadow of Chachma. Finding God in the shadow of suffering is made possible by using your Chachma, as explained above, which allows you to connect with God's Chachma in the unmanifest world, the Yud of the Tetragrammaton. So just some Kabbalah flying here. We have the four letters of God's holy name, the Yud, the He, the Vav, and the He. The Yud, which is the first letter, is referring to the seed of wisdom. It's referring to the Chachma. The Chachma was that vulnerable state of openness and submission that is the, 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 uh, the spark of our soul that we learned about before. So being in the, the shade is referring to the shade of Chachma, which is a quote from Solomon, that when you make it possible using your Chachma, to be in the shadow, to be able to, to, to handle the shade with your chachma, you're able to then handle God's chachma, which means God's unmanifest world, the, the highest level of, of uh, the, un, the unmanifest world. Referring to the unmanifest quality of shade as opposed to the manifested light of overt goodness. So uh, let's just finish with this paragraph. Thus, the Baal Shem Tov once told an individual, accept with love everything that comes upon you in this world, and then you will be able to have both in this world and the world that is coming. That is a quote from a story from Ben Porat Yosef. And this should already be enough for the intelligent reader. So there's a lot of study going on over here. The Alter Rebbe is calling us the intelligent reader, which is, I take as a, as a compliment from the Alter Rebbe. But what is he saying here? He's saying that when we accept suffering, challenges, struggles, with a sense of joy, and like we said, realizing that it's coming from the hidden world that is dark, and just there's so much to talk about. What's hot? What's 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 higher, darkness or light? Of course, light. But according to Torah, there's actually a place of darkness that is beyond the light. If you look at the wick that tonight, when you light the menorah, there is the flame that is illuminating. But then the part that is closer to the wick is actually a darker flame. There's the orange part of the flame. Then there's a darker part of the flame. It's actually a higher level. It's even it's a higher level of light that is dark. So what we're saying here is if you could appreciate the darkness, then you could, when Mashiach comes, the light that we have will also be fully um, revealed. That's what I think the Baal Shem Tov was telling an individual, accept with love everything that comes upon you in this world, then you will be able to have both this world and the world that is coming. I would suggest we have to, there's so much review, if, um, and I, I do plan on covering more ground next week, and uh, even already starting chapter 27. So I suggest doing some homework. I don't think I ever give any of you homework. I'm gonna be reviewing this chapter up until here to really see the flow of how the imperative of joy and using a place of, of sadness as a profit and a gain um, uh, to excel and to, to grow even more. And then how to cope with struggles and challenges, realizing that it's coming from a higher place. Meditate on it. Think about, like, to answer Manny's question, how could I relate to this in a way that I could share this with someone? Is this something I could share with someone? Is this something that I have to keep for myself? And just be totally tuned into this. And you don't only realize this, you don't only learn this when, God forbid, there is suffering. This is something that, that is a reality of how you live. And therefore, anything that comes is going to be taken with joy. A lot to study here. 
Um, we'll end with one uh, section on 303, sorry for the overtime, and there's a practical lesson in the book. I don't think we have it yet on the screen until the end of the chapter, but I'll just read it out loud. If you want to see it in the book, it's on 303. Even misfortunes in financial, health, or family matters will not make you sad when uh, you, understanding that they come from God, you do not resist them and ac accept them willingly. Suffering, in fact, connects you to God more deeply as it rips through directly to the unmanifest world. So realizing that it's coming from a place that just can't be appreciated in the goodness the way it is in this world. It's coming from a level of good that is hidden, unmanifest. When you realize it's coming from such a high place, you can accept it joyfully. So that's connecting you with God in the most high place, in the shadow of God, in the shade of God. Okay, sorry for we went a little bit over time, but we'll end with that for now. And um, happy Hanukkah, Chodesh Tov. God willing, we should only see the good in everything that happens in our life in this week. And it, we should be able to be totally joyful, realizing that it's connecting us with God. And ultimately, we should have Mashiach so we could see the full picture and how it's all um, the best that could be. Have a great Thank afternoon. Thank you so much. What a great class. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Good seeing everybody. Hey, everybody, turn your video on. I'm lonely. I'm lonely by my, well, I'm not by myself. <laughs> I beg your pardon, Robin. I know, no, I'm so glad you're there, Shira. I can always count on looking at your happy face. Barbara, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that I have to get dressed. Bye, bye, Adrian. Nice to hear your voice. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Hak Sameh. Hak Sameh.